Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Heather of Heather's Journal here on YouTube and on Instagram. And this is knitting update number three. So please keep watching if you'd like to see some of the knitting projects that I've been working on recently and how I've been doing with them. So jumping right into it with my first finished object, it is what I'm wearing. This is the Friday Slipover by Petite Knit. It is completely done. I mentioned this, I believe I mentioned the Friday Slipover as a finished project in my last video, but I hadn't blocked it yet. And now it has been blocked, so it is 100% completely done. Blocking really made a huge difference for the size and the fit of this slipover. So I will try to insert a clip of me wearing the slipover before it was blocked, just so you can see the comparison. So I spent yesterday washing and blocking a couple of my knits. I blocked this Friday slipover, which I knit obviously, and I also blocked well, washed this vest as well, which I did not knit myself. I purchased this um, from a thrift store in Denmark. I was really worried about colors bleeding from my navy blue vest into this kind of light cream colored vest. So I used separate bins of water to wash each of these. I'll just kind of show you quickly the setup that I used for washing and blocking my knits because I've never done it before and I've seen videos of people washing and blocking their knits and a lot of people have a really nice setup with kind of fancy laundry washing bins and I thought maybe I needed to purchase some additional materials in order to wash and block my knits but I'll show you what I ended up doing. I actually used a bin from Ikea. I used this bin here. This is the bin that I keep my hats in and it was kind of the right size I thought to be used as a washing bin for my knits. So I filled this about halfway with cool water and I added a teaspoon of the soak soap soak laundry soap I believe soak is the the brand name and I used the yuzu scent I don't have the full bottle I showed in my last video I just got this little sample from my local yarn store and it had enough of the soap in the little package that I could wash both my vests with the one sample package, which was really great. So um, yeah, I just filled my bin about halfway with cold water. I added about a teaspoon of the wool detergent. I sort of swished it around a bit and then just dunked my, I did this vest first. I just submerged it. I let it, I kind of agitated it a little bit just by kind of pushing it, swishing it around a little bit. Let that sit for 15 minutes submerged in the water and then I came back and kind of agitated it once more, pulled it out of the water, just squeezed the water out without wringing it and then I rolled it up in a towel. I kind of stepped on the towel <laughs> to squeeze as much of the water out and I did that a couple times in different spots on the towel so I kind of like rolled it up and squished it twice or three times and then laid it out flat on another towel. I read a web page on Tin Can Knits website talking about how to wash and block your knits and they showed some wires for kind of holding the shape of certain knits I'd imagine that is more useful for kind of lace patterns, but they used it on, I can't remember in their, on their website if it was a sweater or a vest, but anyway, they used it to kind of shape the shoulders. I don't have these blocking wires, so I actually just used a set of chopsticks and I just placed them kind of in the, uh, oops, let me not poke through. I place them in the armholes kind of like this. I'm poking myself now, but that's how I blocked it flat to try to keep the ribbed edges in 
the correct shape and in line with the neckline. I didn't do that on the Friday slipover, I just did it on this one here because I could see that the ribbed edges were sort of folding in a way that I didn't like. So that's why I added the chopsticks. I found these worked well enough. Maybe the wire is better because it's heavier and longer, so you can use them in more versatile ways and they kind of hold their position better. I found these chopsticks were sort of light, so they wouldn't stay put exactly where I put them. But for a first time kind of at home DIY blocking setup, this worked pretty well for me. Once I had finished the whole process for this lighter colored vest, I did the exact same thing with my Friday slipover. And oh my goodness, when I first laid this out on the towel, I was extremely nervous. The slipover had really increased in width and in length. It looked at least one or two sizes larger than it looked before blocking. And I was really, really nervous that it was gonna be too big for me. But at the same time, even though I was worried that it was gonna end up too big, I figured if it does turn out too big, I could wear it oversized or I could also give it away as a gift to someone who it would fit really nicely so it it wasn't like it was going to be the end of the world if it was too big but i was worried that i had put all these hours into knitting the slip over and that it was going to turn out wonky so that was sort of tricky but you know it all worked out in the end so it's okay but if anyone else is feeling that way about blocking their projects which i know a lot of people do you're not alone i think a lot of people feel this way so Anyway, now that I've kind of walked you through the process I use for blocking, I would love if you have any advice or tips for how to do the blocking process better in the future, please let me know. I'm super new to blocking. Obviously, that was my first time ever doing it. And I've seen lots of different things on Instagram about using vinegar while blocking your uh, knits if you have some color work to help avoid bleeding of colors, which I maybe should have done for my... Uh, thrifted vest, but I figured it's been washed and blocked before, surely, if it was being sold in stores. So I wasn't as worried about color bleeding for that one. In the future, I'm sure I will be knitting patterns with color work and I would love to know how to block those properly. So yes, if you have any tips or advice, please leave them in the comments. I would really appreciate it. Okay, so that was the whole blocking process. And I would also love to share the final measurements with you as well. I walked through the measurements from the pattern and from my finished piece in my last knitting update before I had blocked it. But now that I've blocked it, I think I should share the measurements with you again as they have changed. I knit this in the size extra small on Petite Knits pattern and the bust measurement from the pattern is, well the bust circumference measurement from the pattern is 91 centimeters. Before blocking, my knit was 88, 89 centimeters in bust circumference. And after blocking, now it's 97 or 98 centimeters, which is quite a lot larger than the 91 centimeters in the original pattern. That might be because I've measured it wrong. Um, I was kind of measuring the area below the armholes, which I guess isn't really the bust measurement. Anyway, I think this did end up a little bit wider. I could tell when I was blocking it that it was wider than it was originally, so I think it has probably grown a little bit in width. The back width, however, is the same measurement as the original pattern and the same measurement that it was pre-blocking, which is 35 centimeters. The armhole depth has changed. So in the original pattern, her armhole depth is 22.5 centimeters. My armhole depth pre-blocking was 21 centimeters, and now that it's been blocked, it's 25 centimeters. So my armholes are a little bit deeper than petite knits in her pattern, and I think I'm okay with this. I might be able to fix it if I redid the ribbed edges on the armholes, but I don't really mind it. I did just put a tank top on underneath to try and kind of hide how deep the armholes are. So I just have a, a black tank top on underneath. I'll just pull it down so you can see. That's where the armholes of my slipover would actually sit without the tank top underneath. 
it's not terrible it's just a little too big for me so tank top makes it totally fine in my opinion maybe later on i'll decide to kind of redo the armhole ribbed edge to try to fix the armhole depth but for right now it's fine i'll just wear a tank top underneath i'd probably do that anyway so yeah that's the armholes and then the total length is kind of the most interesting or most important for me in my last video i was mentioning how cropped my friday slip over was before blocking and i was really unsure as to how my garment was going to change through blocking if it was going to get the length to a place that i really liked or if i would have to rip back the ribbed edge and knit additional length in the body so now that i have blocked it i am really really happy with the length it worked out really well so in the original pattern the total length is 51 centimeters before blocking, my knit was at about 48, 49 centimeters, which is only a few centimeters short, but it looked quite cropped and I really wanted a longer fit. So now that I have blocked my piece, it is about 54, 55 centimeters in total length, which is three or four centimeters longer than the original pattern dimensions, but I really like the way that it fits. So I'm really happy with it overall. Okay, so now that we've talked about washing, blocking, and the final measurements, I will just quickly mention the other materials used, so the yarn and the needles. I'm really not sure whether I should say the yarn and needles used over and over again because I tend to mention them every single time I bring up this project, and this project has been in like three or four videos now, so if you've watched all those videos, you kind of have to see me explaining the materials used every single time, which I could imagine is kind of um, repetitive. So I'll just breeze through the yarn really quickly. So I held two yarns together while knitting this entire project. The two yarns I held together were the Barocco Ultra Wool Fine in the color 5365. This is a fingering weight, 100% super wash wool and I held this together with the Senna Scarn Tin Silk Mohair in the color 5581. They're both really complementary navy colors in my opinion so um, yeah this is the finished color and the finished product that I achieved by holding these two yarns together. I really like the way that this all kind of came together. I find the mohair isn't too fuzzy it's just kind of the perfect amount of fuzz for me so that's perfect the one thing that i am sort of worried about and have been worried about with all of my knit projects in general is the itchiness of the natural fibers so i have really sensitive skin i find almost all wool products to be quite itchy including merino wool which is supposed to be one of the less irritating fibers so yeah i guess i was a little nervous about how this was going to feel on my skin and i it does feel a little bit itchy but as i mentioned before i have a tank top on underneath and that kind of helps to protect my skin from the fibers and i do sort of feel them on my shoulders it's a little prickly but so is this one and i still wear it anyway even though it's itchy, I can kind of deal with it for a day. I might, I think I mentioned this in a, a previous video as well that I've been thinking about investing in a nice long sleeve shirt, maybe with a mock neck, something that I can wear underneath my slipovers to both make them a little more like autumn, winter, spring appropriate. Um, because it's a little uncomfortable to wear a short sleeve slip over just like this with nothing underneath in the cooler seasons. So I think getting a long sleeve top would really help make these more wearable throughout the year. And if I got one of those, it would also help protect my entire body from the itchiness of the fibers. 
so far yeah like i said i'm finding this a little itchy but it's manageable so i think i'm really happy with how it's kind of turned out and i think for future projects i might try some different blends there is the Semnes Garden Piergint, which is a Norwegian wool. I would love to see how the Norwegian wool compares to the Superwash wool in terms of comfort for me on my sensitive skin. And I, I will also be knitting with the Semnes Garden Sunday, or I guess it's the double Sunday actually, and that is a 100% merino wool. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how those different fibers sort of feel on my skin. So I'll keep kind of like updating with that um, in future videos as well. So the needles that I've been using for this project and pretty much all my other knit projects as well are the Lucke Driftwood Interchangeable Needles. I just have them in a little mug right now to keep them all together. Um, since I didn't buy them as a complete set, I've just been buying the individual tips and cords as I work on new projects that need different needle sizes. So I don't really have a good way to keep these all together, but I have found that just keeping them in the little packs they come in and keeping them all together in a plastic bag or in a mug like I just showed has been working out okay so far. I've got quite the collection going now. I definitely don't have all the sizes, but I have enough to be knitting everything that I've wanted to knit recently. So yes, these are just the driftwood tips. The majority of them are in the three and a half inch needle tip length. Any needles that are larger than seven and a half millimeters will only come in the five inch length. So that's why I have one set of needles that is the five inch length as opposed to the three and a half inch length tips, just because they didn't have this eight millimeter needle size that I needed in um, the shorter tip length. I think I used the four millimeter needle for knitting everything in the broken rib and then the ribbed edges were knit using the three and a half millimeter needle. I mentioned this in a previous video as well, the three cord lengths I used were 40 centimeters, 60 centimeters, and 100 centimeters. So that pretty much covers all of the materials I use, so the yarn and the needles. I also used some Cocoa Knits stitch markers, which you would have seen in a previous video. I'm using those again for other projects I'm working on now. So I think, yeah, they're a really good option. The other thing I wanted to touch on, which I haven't talked about at all in previous videos, is my experience reading this knitting pattern. I've seen a few other knitting podcasters sort of talking about their experiences with different pattern designers and the legibility of their patterns. And so I just kind of wanted to mention my experience. I personally haven't knit very many objects. I think you have seen pretty much all of the objects I've knit in my videos so far. So I'm not an experienced knitter by any means, but I think, you know, I've started working with more and more patterns and I feel like I can kind of comment on the legibility of this pattern from Petite Knit. I think it was a really great pattern to be honest. This was like the third thing that I ever knit using a pattern and it was super easy. Like I would, I would consider this beginner friendly to be honest. I don't think it's listed as such on Petite Knit's website. It does have some techniques that are not techniques that beginners would necessarily be familiar with, but I found the pattern to be very easy to read. And as long as you have access to the internet and you can Google like how to do a, a leaning increase or how to do an Italian bind off, that's really all I needed to be able to figure out how to knit this pattern. The only place I was confused was with the construction. The way you knit this, it's knit top down, you knit the front and back panels first, and then you kind of knit up the shoulders and you connect the shoulders. And so there's a, a place where you have to pick up stitches to knit the additional shoulder length. And I was really confused about where I was supposed to pick up those stitches. I wasn't sure if I was gonna be knitting the armhole section or if I was, I, I just didn't understand that I was going to be knitting up the shoulder to connect with the back. 
After kind of reading the pattern over a couple more times, I realized that it was actually pretty clear in the pattern what I was supposed to do, but I guess since this is the first slip over I've ever knit, having some kind of chart or graphic to show what the construction actually looked like would have been really helpful. But with that being said, I was able to figure it out anyway without that. And I think the pattern is really, really well done, really well written. So five stars, like I think it was great. I just wanted to throw that in quickly because I know people do tend to talk about the legibility of patterns and I just wanted to kind of put out a really good word about Petite Knits pattern, at least this one in particular. So yeah, really great experience if you are sort of new to knitting and you want to knit something a little more complex or maybe try some new techniques, I would definitely recommend this one. I think it was a perfect sort of transitionary pattern for me from going from beginner to slightly more intermediate. I don't know if I'd consider myself intermediate yet, but yeah, I think it was a really great pattern for me in the in the place that I was at in my knitting skills to kind of push me a little bit to go outside my comfort zone, but still in a comfortable way. Okay, so I do have quite a bit of leftover yarn from this project. And I mentioned in one of my previous videos that I wanted to knit the Oslo hat mohair edition from Petite Knit as well with the extra yarn that was left over from my slipover. And I mentioned in my last video that I'm going to be knitting Anna Vensel's spot cowl with the leftover yarn. And I kind of forgot to mention that I decided to not knit the Oslo hat and to knit the spot cowl instead. And the reason for that is twofold. So one, I I went to my local yarn store looking for yarn for something different and I ended up seeing the Oslo hat in the yarn store. Someone had knit a sample piece for the, I believe it was for the Sun Escar and Sunday. The Oslo hat was knit in the adult medium size and just looking at that hat, I kind of decided that it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Maybe I will knit that hat in the future. Also, I think part of the reason why I didn't like the way it looked is because it was the medium size and I have quite a small head, so I knew the medium wouldn't fit me. And I think that's kind of part of the reason why I might knit it in the future anyway, because I don't know how good of a representation the medium size hat was just for, for my size head. I didn't put it on or anything, but yeah, I think seeing that hat in the yarn store sort of made me think, oh, maybe I should kind of keep looking for other patterns in case there's something better. And the other reason why I decided not to knit the Oslo hat is because I was a little concerned I didn't have enough yarn. I do have quite a bit of leftover yarn from the slipover, but I don't know if I have enough for knitting a whole hat. That is, yeah, the second reason why I decided to go with the spot cowl instead. Even though I'm going with the spot cowl, I am still a little worried I won't have enough yarn because from the outside, the spot cowl looks like it only has a little bit of the accent color yarn, in my case, the navy blue, kind of throughout the cowl, but I realized being really unfamiliar with color work, I finally realized that you have to carry that yarn all the way through. So I, I think they're called floats. That's where your yarn is kind of sitting in the back. Like I think this sweater has a pretty good example. You can see the floats inside where that accent yarn is still being held throughout the entire project. So you need enough length to cover your entire project. And that was something I hadn't really considered until recently, but I'm I'm hoping I will still have enough for doing the color work on the spot cowl. I still have my gauge swatch as well. So that gives me a little extra yarn than what I have in just the yarn bolts that are left over from knitting the slipover. So yeah, I'm just hoping I have enough yarn to knit the spot cowl properly. So speaking of the Spot Cowl by Anna Wenzel, I actually cast on last night and this is quite small. I haven't actually gotten much done. It took me at least a couple hours to figure out the Italian bind on 
and get comfortable enough that I wasn't making mistakes. I made quite a few mistakes actually while trying to get this project started and I just noticed this morning that I made another mistake that I'll have to go back and fix. I think I might actually just take this off the needles and restart from the very beginning. I think I'm just so unfamiliar with the Italian bind on and the twisted rib that I have to work for this section of the spot cowl that I should just start again. I've been getting more and more comfortable as I keep doing more rows. And so hopefully now I'm at the point where the twisted rib motion is sort of um, more comfortable or intuitive. I notice myself sometimes accidentally knitting or purling normally. So through the front loops, whereas in the twisted rib, I'm supposed to go through the back loops. So I think now I have done the twisted rib enough that I'm sort of doing it more naturally. So if I restart from the beginning once more, hopefully I won't make any mistakes. At this point, I think the mistakes I made are kind of, it's one or two rows back, which means I'm pretty much gonna be doing the same amount of work if I tink back and start again from there compared to if I just took the whole thing off the needles and restarted. And I think that might be the better way to go about it since I'm not super comfortable with this twisted rib and tinking I think in twisted rib would just be a whole ordeal on its own. So I heard in another knitting podcast recently this phenomenon of you know being really uncomfortable with ripping back or tinking in an unfamiliar stitch and I'm definitely experiencing that right now. I think as beginner knitters we as soon as we make a mistake we feel like we have to like rip it all back and start from scratch because we just don't know how to fix our mistakes and i would say i am sort of feeling that way right now i definitely could figure this out so for example if i was like halfway through my project and i made a mistake i would definitely take the time to learn how to fix it and take the time to tink every individual stitch or whatever I needed to do. But since I have just begun and I've only knit, I think I'm on my fourth or fifth row, I'm just gonna, I think I'll just undo it. So anyway, yes, this is my spot cowl so far. It will probably become yarn again and I will cast it on again. But with this, I will just show my Cocoa Knit stitch markers are in use again. As I mentioned in a previous video, I just have these like opening stitch markers. So they have a round circular section which fits over your needle. And then they also have like a safety pin clasp or opening so that you can also kind of take them on and off your needles freely or stick them on existing work instead of putting them on your needles. and they have a bunch of different colors in this pack that I purchased and I have been kind of color coding. So when I was doing my Italian bind on, I since I was doing the Italian bind on on circular needles, it's really hard to count your stitches. Once the stitches are off the actual straight needle and on the cord. So I place a stitch, stitch marker every 20 stitches and I did them in rainbow order for no particular reason other than I thought it would be fun and it actually worked out really well I think and I just used the red one to mark the start of a new row. So yes I've been really enjoying the colorful stitch markers and in my last video I was a little bit confused about what size needles these would fit and it turns out they just fit on the eight millimeter needles, which is perfect because that's the largest needle, needle size that I have. So actually that's not true. I have a US 17, so 12.75 millimeter needle, but I don't think I'll be using those again. So it doesn't matter that these stitch markers don't fit on those needles. They do fit on my largest set of needles for my interchangeable needle set. So yeah, stitch markers are working out well. The um, actual knitting for this spot cowl is definitely challenging for me at my current skill level, 
but I think that's good. It's good to be a little bit uncomfortable and to learn some new skills. I'm also really excited to see how this bot cowl turns out. And as I mentioned previously, I would really, really love to knit the spot sweater at some point. So the spot cowl, I think, is a good place to start just to learn some of the techniques that are being used in the spot sweater. Okay, so yarn for the spot cowl. I'm using the Senna Scarn Double Sunday in the color 1001, which is this white. And I'm holding that together with the Senna Scarn Tin Silk Mohair in the color 1012, which is kind of more of a, a yellowy white compared to the Double Sunday. But as you can see, now that I am holding them together in the work, I think it looks really nice. I think it's a nice color. It's quite hard to tell because this is only about four or five rows, so it's very skinny. Um, but yeah, I'm liking the color so far. I should mention the needles. I am using the Lucke Driftwood Interchangeable Needle Set. These are the four and a half millimeter needles. And yeah, I'll just show you quickly. You can see where the needles attach. For some reason, one of these needle tips wasn't really fitting on the connector very well. I had to use the pin to like really tighten it on there because it didn't want to get past the threads. For some reason it was getting stuck on the threads about a millimeter or two away from the connector where it should lie flush. So I'm not sure why that happened. I thought maybe there was something wrong with the threads in the needle tip or maybe there was something blocking, but yeah, it all worked out in the end. I got them on and now I'm knitting with them and they're just a joy to work with, to be honest. I'm really, really enjoying the Driftwood set from Luca. So yes, okay, that's the yarn. Those are the needles. And as you know, my accent color, or I'm not sure what it's called, my second color for the color work in the spot cowl will be the Barocco Ultra Wool Fine Held Double and also held together with the um, Sunnescarn Tin Silk Mohair in the navy blue as well. I haven't quite figured out how I'm going to hold the Barocco Ultra Wool Double because I have one ball of it left and the spot cowl is a DK weight pattern, so I will have to hold the fingering weight, this fingering weight yarn double. Um, I don't know if that means I should kind of pull all the yarn out of the ball and find the halfway point and then wind up a ball with kind of the two ends. I don't know. So that's something I need to figure out as well. If you have any tips or advice for how to hold the fingering weight yarn double when it is in a skein like this, please let me know. Because yeah, that is one thing I'm really trying to kind of piece together right now. That's everything I wanted to mention about the spot cowl. The spot cowl will be a gift for someone, for my mom, for Christmas. So I need to restart, cast on, and get it knit pretty quickly because the holidays are coming up really quickly. Um, on the theme of gift knitting, I will also be knitting a little headband, I think, for someone for the holidays. Um, I just saw November Knits has a birthday sale going on right now. I think she's turning 32, and so all of her patterns on her website are 50% off right now. And so I just picked up the Yule headband from November Knits for 50% off, which is really, really affordable really incredibly affordable. Already a headband or hat pattern is gonna be affordable, but at 50% off, it was like $2, which is really, really great, especially since I'm spending so much money in preparation for the holidays right now. So I really appreciated the sale where I could get one. Um, so yeah, go support November Knits if you can. So yes, I bought the, I think it's called the Yule headband. The only reason why <laughs> I say that is because I'm actually learning Swedish right now. And so, I've been having fun kind of like reading all these Danish pattern designers Instagram posts which are written in Danish or like trying to figure out how to pronounce Lucke in Norwegian. I mean it's very possible that I'm pronouncing it wrong but 
I'm, I've been having fun trying to figure it out. So maybe it's called the Ju headband or Jo headband. In my head, it's the Yu headband. So I purchased that headband and it is knit in stockinette stitch, which I think is really pretty and I'm really excited to knit it up. The only thing I'm worried about is the thickness of the headband. Since it is folded stockinette, I believe, it might be sort of puffy, a little too thick for my liking. So I'll have to see when I knit that how thick it ends up being. And if it is too thick, I have the petite knit weekend headband kind of in the back of my mind as sort of an alternate headband that I can knit if the November Knits Yule headband turns out a little too thick for my liking. So yes, that is kind of like where I'm at with the headband. Not sure which yarn I'm going to use to knit the headband. I'm thinking of knitting it in a neutral color, so like white, black, gray, something in there. Um, if I have any of the double Sunday leftover, I might just use that. Can't actually remember what yarn weight is used for the Yule headband. I'll have to double check that, but I mean, worst case, I have to buy a new ball of yarn and I find that process to be really fun anyway. Oh, I found this lovely DK yarn in my local yarn store a couple days ago. I would love to knit something with that. It is a hand dyed yarn, so it is quite expensive but it was so soft. It's a, it's a super wash merino, I believe. And, oh, I would just love to knit with that. It's in the same color way as this other yarn that I picked up. I think I'm just gonna segue into this now. Um, this is the yarn that I picked up. Oh my gosh, I think this is just gorgeous. It is a, Superwash Merino, this is a sock yarn. So it's with nylon as well. And this color is called Free Range, which I love. It sort of gives like eggshell, farm, I don't know, I just love it. It's got greens, yellows, reds, like burgundy. Oh my gosh, I just think it's delicious. I love it. So yeah, I'll be knitting a pair of socks with this yarn. I should mention, this is from a brand called Puzzle Tree Yarns, and it is hand dyed, as I mentioned. It is 75% merino and 25% nylon, which I think is a really great blend for a uh, sock. The gauge, I don't know if you call it gauge, it is about 28 to 30 stitches per four inches using the recommended needle size of 2.25 to 3.5 millimeter needles. Those are the specs of this yarn. Like I was just kind of mentioning, I found another yarn in this same colorway, free range, um, but a DK weight yarn that I think would be really beautiful for something. This I think would be really beautiful as like a full sweater or a cardigan or something, but it is so expensive because it's a hand dyed yarn that I just don't think that I could purchase enough of that yarn to knit something large. So. Yeah, this, like I mentioned, sock yarn. So I'll be knitting a pair of socks with this. This yarn actually inspired me to learn the difference between all these different kinds of yarn packaging that you can purchase. So I learned, I think, that this type of yarn packaging, or like, I don't know, this twisty thing that this yarn is held in, this is called a hank. And this one, I believe is called a skein because it's this like oval shape instead of just a ball. So instead of calling this a ball of yarn, you'd call it a skein of yarn. This is a hank. So with a skein, you can typically do a center pull, which is what I typically do with my yarn, just because then you don't have to worry about your yarn ball kind of rolling around as you pull it, which tends to happen with the mohair since you can't do a center pull with this. You know what? I just realized I don't know what this one's called. Is this a cake? Is this a ball? I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so as I pull more of this yarn, it sort of has to tumble around so that the yarn can unwrap. This hank, the way that this yarn is situated, I don't know. The way that this yarn is wrapped up 
means that there's no center that you can pull from and you also can't just unravel the yarn from the outside so you have to process the hank before you can use the yarn and typically i believe you'd use a ball winder to do that i don't personally have a ball winder and i think that my local yarn store has one that you can just use but that means that i have to like go to my yarn store to wind this hank i'm really excited about starting my sock knitting so what i'm going to do is try to wind a ball of this yarn by hand so i believe from the research i've done that i just kind of somehow untwist this hank and then it'll just be this really big sort of circle of yarn and i need to somehow hold the circle open and i think i'll just use two of my big kind of uh, bar stool style chairs and I'll put the backs together and wrap the yarn around the backs of the chairs and pull them apart so that the yarn is held taut and then I should be able to find the outside piece of yarn and start to unravel the hank and twist that into a ball of yarn myself by hand. Could use a ball winder as mentioned but because I don't have one I'll just be doing it by hand and I have actually sort of recently learned how to hand wind a ball of yarn that has a center pull. So I think that's gonna be my plan of action is to wind a ball of center pull yarn from this hank by hand. So I'll let you know how that process goes, but I just wanted to show you this yarn while it's still in hank form because I just think it's so gorgeous and you can really see the colors um, when it's kind of in this shape. So yeah, here, let me just give you a close up of this really quick so you can see the colors. Oh, I just think it's so beautiful. So yes, I will be knitting my very first pair of socks with this yarn and the pattern I will be using to knit this pair of socks is the rye light sock by tin can knits and the reason why i chose that pattern is simply because it is written so well for someone who's never knit a sock before they have tons of diagrams showing the construction of the sock and lots of videos that will help you kind of learn the te techniques you need to know to knit the pair of socks so that's why i went with that pattern the only concern I have with using the Rylite pattern is that their gauge is different than what I think I'll be able to achieve with this yarn. I believe they knit the main kind of part of their socks on 2.75 millimeter needles and they knit the like cuffs in 2.25 millimeter needles and their gauge is something like 36 stitches per inch does that make sense or is it per four inches probably per four inches um i haven't knit a gauge swatch yet but i'm a little worried since on the package it says this will be between 28 and 30 stitches per inch that my my gauge i'm not going to meet gauge for the rye light sock pattern so yeah, that's kind of the one thing I'm worried about, but you know, I'll see how it goes once I get to that point. The other thing I will mention is that um, I needed to purchase needles for sock knitting. I don't have anything smaller than a 3.5 millimeter needle at the moment. And so I tried to see if I could get smaller needles to go with my Luke interchangeable needle set but they don't have any wooden needles below three millimeters. So I had to kind of get something different. And as I mentioned in a previous video, I watched Handmade by Florence's sock knitting video um, where she talks about all the different types of materials you can use to knit socks. And her preferred method is a set of circular needles. I believe she uses the Chiagu interchangeable needle set um, or maybe they're not interchangeable needles, they might just be circular needles, but anyway she uses those with the magic loop method and that works really well for her. I thought that sounded really great. 
but when I went to my yarn store, they didn't have the Chiagu needles. They did, however, have the Knitter's Pride wooden needles in the size that I needed. So I, I first picked out the 2.25 millimeter needles because I figured, you know, my yarn might be a little bit heavier weight than the yarn used in the rye light pattern. And so if I just knit the whole sock with 2.25 millimeter needles, then maybe I would actually meet gauge. But when I was checking out, um, the person at the cash at the yarn store told me that 2.25 millimeter needles might just be too small for this yarn. So I picked up the 2.75 millimeter needles instead. As I mentioned, these are the Knitter's Pride 2.75 millimeter wooden needles. They're this kind of nice like reddish wood color, which is pretty. And I have used Knitter's Pride double pointed needles before. Um, I have a set of wooden double pointed needles in a really huge needle size. They're 12.75 millimeters. And those were so lovely to work with. I mean, they're really giant needles, but the wood I found is really nice. And I believe these needles have a very similar finish. So, or maybe these have more of a coating on them. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't knit with these yet. I'm waiting until I process my yarn, but I will maybe knit a gauge swatch with the 2.75 millimeter needles and see how my gauge is looking. If my gauge doesn't work for the rye light pattern, I'll probably adjust and maybe pick a different pattern or I don't know. I, I, I'm going to have to find a way to make it work. I could also buy a set of smaller needles, but it, it's possible that I'll just have to pick a different pattern than the rye light and find a pattern that works for the yarn weight that I do have since I'm so set on knitting a pair of socks in this color. I just think they'll be gorgeous. So I will keep you posted on how the sock knitting kind of goes for me. The one other thing I wanted to mention about sock knitting is when I see hand knit socks, a lot of times I'm like really paying attention to the toe. When I was looking through potential patterns to knit these socks with, I was looking at the toes of the socks just because I want the toes to be really comfortable. And sometimes with hand knit socks, you have like really pointy ends on the toes of your socks, which is weird because typically on the human foot, you, you shouldn't really have a point. It should almost be kind of flat at the, at the front because your toes sort of sit in this shape, right? They don't sit in that shape. That's something that I've been mindful of as I'm looking through sock patterns. And I actually just saw on Instagram, um, a creator, her Instagram handle is paper flower knits. She posted a reel talking about how to knit an anatomical toe for a hand knit sock. And I screenshotted her reel because she included the pattern she uses for knitting the toes of her socks. Um, because doesn't that make so much more sense? Knitting a sock toe in the actual shape that your foot is like, that makes so much more sense to me. So yeah, I saved that for when I get to that point. And, um, I think that gives me a little more freedom to pick a different pattern that doesn't necessarily have the toe that I would like, but I can use paper flower knits kind of anatomical toe pattern to sub in maybe, maybe that's a little too complex for my very first sock knitting project, but I think knitting an anatomical toe makes a lot of sense for a hand knit sock. So just in terms of making it comfortable, I think the only reason why, you know, someone might not recommend knitting an anatomical toe is because that means you always have to wear the left sock on the left foot and the right sock on the right foot, which means that the wear of the socks is always going to be hitting the same place. Whereas if you were to knit like, socks that can be worn on either foot, then you might wear them on different feet and that alternates the pressure on the socks so that you might not be wearing the same places as quickly, if that makes any sense. 
So I think, you know, the one downside to knitting an anatomical toe on a hand knit sock is that you might wear through those socks faster. So yeah, I don't really know what I'm gonna do yet. I'll have to see how I'm feeling once I get to the end of knitting this sock. But you know, that's in mind. The anatomical toe thing is definitely something I'm interested in trying. So let me know if you have any experience knitting socks, what kind of toe you like to knit, if you have any tips. Um, also, if you have any pattern recommendations for a yarn like this one that I got from Puzzle Tree Yarns, this is 28 to 30 stitches per four inches, according to the label. The other question I have is what WPI means. I've been seeing this on a lot of different yarns. It says approximately 14 WPI. What does that mean? Maybe I could just Google it, but I haven't yet. So if anyone knows and you feel like telling me, please let me know. I only have one more thing to bring up. I know this is a long video already, but let me just show you one last thing um, before I go. So in my last video, I mentioned that I am knitting a sweater for my partner and it's going pretty well, I would say. Um, I'm using a free pattern from Lion Brand Yarns website. The free pattern is called the Adult Raglan Sleeve Pullover Knit. And this is the very first raglan sweater I'm ever knitting. And I'm honestly really confused by the raglan construction. I have tried Googling raglan construction and I've watched a bunch of videos of people knitting raglan sweaters, but I don't think any of them are knit in exactly the same way that the pattern I'm using is knit in. So I'm feeling a little bit lost. Uh, I asked my mom if she could help me kind of piece together what the heck is going on in the pattern and she was very helpful, but I'm still a little confused. So I think in my last video, I showed you that I had knit the back panel, which from the pattern, I think I've done correctly with decreasing in this kind of way. So it's hard to tell because the stockinette stitch will kind of roll in, but this is what it looks like on either side. So yeah, that's the back. I have also knit the front panel, which has different shaping at the top. Again, I'm really not sure I've done this correctly, um, but it has like more of a neckline shape, which makes sense to me. And then it has these two sort of points. And then again, the same shape going down to the underarms like this. Um, So I think this makes sense so far, like this, um, that looks good to me. And I'm enjoying the color blocking that I've done on this. So that's good. I'm using a thrifted yarn to knit this, which means the yarn that I have is all the yarn that I will ever have. I can't buy more of this. So I have to make sure that I'm using my yarn efficiently, I guess and doing a good job balancing how much yarn I'm using for the different color blocking sections. So anyway, yeah, that's the front and back panel. And then I have also knit the sleeve. The second one is in progress, but this is the sleeve. So it'll have the gray at the cuff like this, and then it'll come up to the white and uh, yeah, so this is just like a really long triangle, essentially. That's how I did the decrease on the sleeve. So I kind of think, you know, this part will attach to the main body somehow under the arm. And then the decreases going up to this point will kind of be like the raglan attaching to the front and back panel, maybe. I don't know guys, I'm really confused. I'm really hoping I can figure this out. Um, but you know, that looks like a sleeve to me. <laughs> so I just have to figure out the construction and I am still knitting the second sleeve. It's uh, really small at this point, there's the cuff and I just switched colors. I have definitely been playing yarn chicken with, I think that's what it's called. I've heard people talking about playing yarn chicken I don't fully understand what that means, but I think that's what I've been doing for knitting the sleeves of this sweater. 
because the gray yarn is the one I had the least of when I first started this project. And so that's why I chose to put the gray at the bottom because I figured, you know, if the ends of the sleeves have a smaller kind of like block of color than the other two parts, then that's fine. So you can see like this oatmeal color is quite a bit thicker. Uh, like the color block itself is wider than the gray. They were at one point more even. So I knit this sleeve first and I did actually have quite a few more rows of the gray. And then I tried knitting the second sleeve and I could really only get about the cuff and then maybe two rows, two or three rows before running out of the gray yarn. So what I did <laughs> is I unraveled a row of this yarn and I would then knit with the yarn I removed from this sleeve onto this one. So they were both using the same yarn ball. I just used the end of this one. Once I'd finished knitting it, I kind of like undid a row and then cast on with my other set of needles. That maybe wasn't the best idea, but that's what I did. I would just undo one row of the left sleeve and add a row to the right sleeve. And I just did that until they were about the same length and I had enough yarn left over that I could use at the end to sew up the front and back panel in gray. It wasn't the best or most fun process, but I think that was the best way that I could think of to sort of even out the amount of yarn and make sure I had enough gray to finish the whole sweater. So yeah, my sleeves, the, the gray part of my sleeves aren't quite as long as I had hoped to match the main body of the sweater, but I think it's fine. I think it's still going to turn out pretty nice. So I'm not sure if I mentioned in a previous video, but I tried using a row counter for the first time. I don't have a physical row counter, so what I did is downloaded a row counting app. And that's what I used for counting rows while knitting the Friday slipover. I really needed to keep track of my rows for certain sections. So yeah, that was kind of the method I used. and. It was fine, like it, it was super helpful for knitting my Friday slipover to just be able to keep track of the rows somehow, but I realized after using that kind of row counter on my phone for a while that I don't like having to pick up my phone to add a row every time. Like when I'm knitting, I like to just knit and not have to reach for my phone, um, you know, sometimes if I pick up my phone, I see a notification and I get distracted. And sometimes when I'm knitting, I just want to knit and I don't want to have to worry about my phone or anything. So what I actually started doing is using a whiteboard to keep track of my rows. I really only started doing that when I was doing the yarn chicken for the sleeves of my raglan sweater, but I have been using that method for my spot cowl as well. It's a really good way, I think, for me since I I'm like a very tactile person and I love using a whiteboard. <laughs> I use a whiteboard every chance I get because I don't know, something about it, I just love it. So I'm actually really enjoying using a whiteboard as a row counter, not for everyone I'm sure, but it's working out really well for me. My whiteboard is very messy, but I'll just show you kind of how I've been using it. I think it's fine if I show you this since the adult raglan sleeve pullover is a free pattern that is just available for download. So I'm not like showing you anything you can't see since you can just access this yourself. This is really messy, but um, yeah, this is like kind of how I figured out the gray color issue for my sleeves. So I just wrote down the row numbers for each of my sleeves and you can see now they're both 14, rows 14 are circled because that's kind of where I ended up. But at first, sleeve one was at like row six or something and sleeve two was at row 18, I believe. And then I would just kind of like put an X next to whichever one I was currently working on or had just finished. And then I was just kind of going back and forth until they evened out. And this was really helpful since um, there were some increases being worked in each of the sleeves and kind of alternating between two sleeves and trying to keep track of, you know, when to do the increases I thought would be really challenging. So writing it all down 
and like putting down purl knit, purl knit increase one um, for each of the rows really helped me just to keep track of what was going on and make sure I wasn't making any mistakes. So yeah, that was what I did. And you can see like in this like turquoise color, I just continued using the whiteboard as a row counter once I would finished the yarn chicken part. And so I was just kind of marking like, yeah, I finished these rows as I went down and again, marking my increases so I wouldn't forget. Um, yeah, like super easy, low cost way to, you know, count your rows. If you have a whiteboard and whiteboard markers lying around at home, maybe it's kind of like too much of a hassle. I can't just do this on the couch now. Um, I kind of have to like sit at my desk to do it. But for patterns where I actually really have to focus, I, I don't mind doing that. I'd actually prefer to like sit at a desk and really pay attention instead of sitting on the couch and getting distracted. So I think that's one of the other things I'm kind of learning as I'm knitting more is that there are different types of projects that require different amounts of my attention. And so I'm starting to learn which ones I can do in which situations. So there are certain knits that I can take with me outside of my house and like knit on the bus or at the park or at a coffee shop or whatever. And those are just like easy knits that don't require a lot of attention. Uh, so something that's just like in stockinette stitch and I'm just doing a whole bunch of rows with no increases, no decreases, nothing super interesting. I can do that wherever. But for something like the spot cowl, where I'm using the Italian bind on, which I've never done before, I'm learning how to knit in twisted rib. That's something where I really need to sit down and focus on what I'm doing. So I think ideally I would like to have a variety of projects going on at a time. Historically, I've been a pretty monogamous knitter. I've never had more than one project going on at a time. So things are sort of shifting a little bit. As you can see, I'm working on the raglan sweater and I have the spot cowl going. I'm gonna cast on those socks pretty soon. So I will have a bunch of projects on the go at once. I think ideally when I have multiple projects on the go, I should have at least one that is like sort of easy knitting that I can take with me and not have to sit down and really focus on. And then maybe I have another one that does require more attention that I can do at home. Um, you know, having that variety of knitting projects, I think is a really good way to go. And that's, I think what I would like to do moving forward. So uh, yeah, with that, I think that's everything I have to share with you today. If you would like to keep updated with kind of how my projects are going, you can subscribe to my channel. You can follow my Instagram. It's heathers.journal. I should be kind of posting more frequently now that I have so many projects going on. So yeah, feel free to kind of follow along if you'd like. I would just like to say thank you for watching. Um, I have just kind of started this YouTube and Instagram thing and I'm having so much fun with it so far. I know like my channel is really small and I'm not getting that many views, but just being able to film these videos and chat about what I'm really interested in and passionate about is really fun for me. So yeah, anyway. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you have a lovely rest of your week. And I hope that your knitting projects are going really well if you're working on anything right now. And yeah, with that, I think that's everything. So take care. Bye.